Greetings and welcome to the Out and Equal Workplace Advocates Town Call. Today we're talking about the implementation of industry-wide transition guidelines for employees and employers and Transgender Day of Remembrance. So today we're very pleased to bring you this town call on such an important and timely topic. And we thank you all for being here today. Before I introduce our speakers, I just wanted to take a moment. Sorry about that. So today for our for our our, um, our town call, we have some amazing speakers. We have Jameson Green, who is the president of the World Professional Association for Transgender Health. Miss Jenna Cook from Johnson and Johnson. Miss Stephanie Badalino from New York Life Insurance Company. Christina Nicole Canavale from Johnson and Johnson. And before I turn it over to our speakers, I do have a few announcements to make. We have some upcoming town calls, and you'll see them listed there on the screen. We also have on February 26th a very important thing, which is our kickoff for opening up our workshop proposals for our annual workplace summit which this year will take place October 5th through the 8th in Dallas, Texas. So it would be very important for people to look at that RFP process and submit your proposals for us to really build a very strong and diverse program for our Dallas Workplace Summit. We also have some information on line for a variety of other things, our university and training, our regional affiliates, employee resource groups, career link, and more information about our summit, and our upcoming executive forum, which will take place in San Francisco March 24th through the 26th. So if you want some information on any of those, you can find it on our website. The webinar features, so this is a broadcast webinar. You can ask questions during the presentation by going to the screen where you can type in a, under the chat a question, and we will address all of those questions or as many as we possibly can at the end of the presentation. Throughout the webinar, we will also be asking certain questions. It will be an opportunity for you to submit your answers and to see the results. This webinar is recorded and you will receive a link as a follow-up email from ReadyTalk after the call, which will also include all of these slides. So now it gives me great pleasure to turn it over to Jameson Green. Thank you, John. Um, <laughs> I'm here today to talk about a couple of different things, and uh, one is related to the, the um, Workplace Transition Guidelines and, and, the, and the World Professional Association for Transgender Health's impact on those. But today is November 20th, which is the Transgender Day of Remembrance. And that is a very solemn day for transgender people as we recognize and remember the lives of the people who have been harmed and destroyed by violence, by anti-trans prejudice around the world. And this is an event that started with a, as a small vigil in San Francisco in 1998, 1999, and 2000. It was, it, it was, in, in 1998, it was actually a, a tiny street corner thing. In 1999, it, we actually had some political um, acknowledgement from city officials, and then in 2000 it was incorporated into events that included a march and uh, presentations at the LGBT Center in San Francisco. But since then it has grown to be a global phenomenon, and people around the world gather on this day or around this day and usually say the names of the people who have been killed since the last 
commemorative event. So in the last year, uh, actually 81 lives have been lost due to hate and prejudice. And this is something that we want to bring attention to. The Day of Remembrance events are not to be uh, turned into some kind of a pride thing. They are really about the impact of the problem of the disposability of trans lives. Most of the people who are murdered, their killers are never apprehended, they're never punished. And these murders are grisly and horrible. And the purpose of this event is to bring that attention to this to the world and to show that this needs to stop. So every year on November 20th, we again remember the people who have been killed since the last time we were talking about this. And uh, we hope that someday the names, the list of names will diminish and that we will never have to hold one of these again. So I guess we wanted to ask people to participate in a way by being able to pass to chat in the names of anyone that you have lost or people who have been harmed by transphobia. And if other of our presenters have comments about this, to please chime in at this moment and then we'll move on to more business-like con content. This is an important day for trans people, and so we appreciate the attention that Out and Equal is giving to this event. Jameson, thank you for that, that very touching introduction to the town call. And um, I think that the information that's going to follow is going to be very helpful for everybody on this call. What I'd like thank to do you, now is to um, have people take a few minutes. We have a couple of questions for everybody. So the first question that we'd like to ask you to do is to identify, um, how do you identify yourself? And if you could take a minute and um, check the box that's most appropriate, then we'll move on to the next question. giving people a few more seconds. Okay, and then <clears throat> you'll see the graph there. As always, it's very reassuring to see so many of our allies on these calls as well. The next question, uh, are you out as LGBT at work? Again, if you could take a few minutes to, a few seconds to respond to that, we'd appreciate that. see the results from that. And our final question at this point is, did you attend the recent Out and Equal Summit in San Francisco, which took place just a few weeks ago?
So just over 20% of people attended the summit. Um, again, our summit will take place in Dallas, October 5 through the 8th in 2015, so we hope to see most of you there. And just a little bit of a, a recap of this past year's workshops focusing on transgender issues. You'll notice that the different topics that were listed there, and it was a very diverse group of topics and presenters, so that you'll see that we, they were focused on health care, on workplace, workplace equality, on military issues, on religious issues, et cetera. So it's a wealth of good resources for people to look into, and you'll be able to find some of those presentations on our website and also look forward to some virtual web and virtual summits that will feature some of the topics you'll see here. And so speaking of the, the summit, um, I just want to ask our presenters to kind of give a few minutes of a highlight of what they took away from this year's summit. So Jenna, are you on the line? How about Stephanie? I am, John, and thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, well, I have to say, um, I had somebody come up to me while I was at the summit, one of my peers, actually, who was on the uh, part of the New York Life delegation, and, uh, and he said to me, he said, because I've been to like eight or nine of these now. I started in, uh, in, in Washington, D.C. back oh so many years ago. And, um, and he said to me, he said, well, how has this one, how does this compare to previous summits that you've been to? And I thought it was a really excellent question, and I, I thought for a moment, and I said, well, you know, I have to say we have evolved so, so much in the content that we now have uh, for, you know, for people that are um, needing to, um, to learn more about the trans community and what our workplace issues are. I mean, I can remember back in D.C., we were just a small but mighty contingent. And if, if memory serves, you know, you could count the number of workshops that were trans-related on one hand. Um, but but look at how far we've come, and 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 I, and I think that was very. It's just very gratifying to me to see that measure that you know that level of visibility and that level of um, of of a of a thirst. I would say for for education about our community. I mean, in any of the workshops that I was involved in this year, um, you know, the vast majority of people that were in there were people that I would consider uh, as allies and, for that matter, first-timers uh, to the summit. And, um, and that's what's so wonderful about coming back every year and, and educating and presenting because you're, 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 you're helping more and more people um, take the message forward about workplace equality for the trans and gender nonconforming communities. So um, it was a very uplift, uplifting experience for me, John. Great. Thank you, Stephanie. And Jameson? Thanks, John. Yes, I thought this year was particularly well integrated. Um, for myself, having been to probably a dozen uh, summits, it's, I was struck by the level of diversity of people who were attending all the workshops. I thought, I was very, very impressed that the, what seems to be the net result is that, or where this seems to be coming from, is that people are getting the message about diversity and inclusion in really integral ways. And so more of a variety of people are coming to sessions, and this is not just the trans sessions, but other sessions too, where there's cross-pollination going on, and there are it's not like, like sessions that are focused on gay issues are not attended by just gay people. Sessions that are focused on trans issues are not attended by just trans people. That level of interest and curiosity and commitment to issues of other people's experience is really what strengthens our movement. And so I'm really glad to see that. Great. Thank you. Christina? I 
so for everybody listening, we, we have Christina and Jenna. Um, they should be joining us shortly, and we will come back to them uh, when they do join the call. But I have to say from, for myself, from the summit highlights, it was, it, as um, Jameson and Stephanie have already mentioned, the diversity in the offerings of the over 120 workshops uh, was very well received by the participants, and it's an opportunity for people to share best practices and learn from one another. So I know that um, everybody on this panel was very involved in the creation of, of the workshops, and I, I do appreciate them for that. So with that, we're going to turn it back over to Stephanie, who's going to talk about some of the, the very um, rewarding but very time-consuming and, and, and uh, important work that people are doing on the transition guidelines. So, Stephanie? Uh, thanks, John. Uh, well, first of all, I have to say um, it was time-consuming work for a lot of individuals. Uh, what we're about to kind of go over in, 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 in thumbnail fashion is, is the culmination of a lot of wonderful work uh, within the Transgender Advisory Committee. Uh, I've been Jameson and I, and Jameson, I think you've been on it a couple of years longer than I. I think I've been on it now five or six years. I'm not quite sure, but um, but it, it it really is was a, a group effort uh, in, in in coming together with these. And I, and I think that's important for people to understand because uh, what we I think all felt very strongly about within the committee as we began to talk about pulling together a comprehensive set of workplace transition guidelines is that. It's coming from, the genesis of it is from trans people. Um, you know, just to step back for a moment, the Trans Advisory Committee, for those that may not be aware that are on the call this afternoon, um, you know, brings a, a wealth of experience to the table. Uh, we all um, have various stories of workplace transitions and, and how we've, um, in various venues, and how we've, uh, successfully or in some cases perhaps not so successfully uh, dealt with them. And I, and I just want everyone to know that we've we brought all that experience to bear in creating these guidelines because basically, you know, you can sit back and say, well, you know, the trans community, we're kind of like the flavor of the month these days. You know, everybody, you know, the, the obviously the corporate equality index has a lot to do with it and how – They've raised the bar with respect to trans-inclusive health care and, and what have you. But, um, but what, what we realize is that uh, companies are still struggling uh, with respect to, you know, so what do we actually do? You know, there, there's, there's surely a, a commitment that's been displayed to diversity on a high level. And, and there's policy and there's procedure on some level. That, that supports that, but we felt that it was very, very important to to pull a, a comprehensive set of guidelines together that will help companies um, celebrate the individuality of their employees and especially their their trans employees because we realize that some companies um, you know they fall into two broad categories they may be in the throes of getting these policies and procedures together and they really don't know where to turn or they may have some set of them that they've developed themselves or that they've used other external sources for, but they are still struggling with how best to implement them. Because it's one thing to have a set of policies and procedures, and it's a horse of a different color when one talks about how best to implement these. And that's where communication comes into play and that sort of thing. So what we've done is we've, we've, we've tried to address that in these guidelines by – um, by, by making them as comprehensive as, as we could make them. And what we did at the summit, for those of you um, that did not attend, is we had a roundtable session where we, you know, we, where we asked people to come in and, and, and work with uh, members of the Trans Advisory Committee that were there on site. And, and we, we broke up the guidelines, and I'll go over, them, over the separate sections in just a minute so you have a sense of what we actually have in, in, inside the document. And we each worked in small teams and gathered and garnered input from the individuals that participated in the round table so that we could better fill out those sections and have them, um, uh, you know, better represent uh, a wide range of, of input and a wide range of situations. 
Uh, because the one thing that we certainly didn't want to fall into, the trap we didn't want to fall into as a committee, was that you know all, all, all ideas are invented here. Uh, we, did, we, we certainly do not embrace that, and we, we wanted this document to be as collaborative as possible. So we are now in the process of, of, of distilling that in input and, and working it back into the document so that when we do release the document, it'll be, it'll, it, we hope that it's going to be a resource that uh, people come back to time and time again for assistance with uh, developing their, their own work policies and in implementing them. Because we know that there are a number of different individuals that might be coming to this document for help. We know that potentially, and, and we hope quite frankly, that it would be human resources professionals, diversity and inclusion professor, professionals, uh, ERG, LGBTQ ERG leaders would be coming to this document for assistance. Um, as well as transgender and gender nonconforming employees themselves that are planning to transition and, and, they may, and, they, and they may be in a situation like I was a number of years ago at my company where I really had to lead them by the hand because they'd never done this before because I was really the first one that ever did anything like this. So, you know, having a, a roadmap, if you will, to go on and, and, and to go by is, uh, is, is something that is essential. So, so again, we wanted to make sure that the document was accessible to uh, a wide range of individuals that um, could use it and, and learn from it and, and then implement it. And then also, um, we stand ready as a committee to, um, to assist wherever possible, whether it's back through the regional affiliates or directly with companies, uh, the individuals at companies themselves, to help you along the way. Uh, we certainly don't want you to think that this is something like, you know, you leave it, we just, you know, plop it on your desk and then, and then you know, and then wave goodbye and say see you later. Not, hardly. We want to make sure that, um, you know, that we are positioned as, as a resource for you moving forward. And, and I think I speak for the entire committee when I say that. So, so, um, so I'd like to then uh, move into exactly what's contained in the document so you have a sense of, um, of what we've worked on. Uh, but before I do that, Jameson, I think it's just you and I for the time being. Is there anything else that, from an overview perspective that perhaps you wanted to add to, uh, to my opening comments? Well, thanks, Stephanie. I actually think that guidelines can be a difficult document, difficult kind of document, because we tend to want things to be very, very concrete. And, and situations with human beings involved are not always concrete. And so we really intend these guidelines to be guidelines, not a checklist. And situations have to be taken into account that where you adapt things to your particular environment. And so we want to make room for that. And this is much like the WPATH standards of care for the health of transsexual, transgender, and gender nonconforming people. It's not a checklist. It's a guideline, and it basically provides all of the the information that you need. And then you have to take and pick and choose what works in your situation frequently. And that's the way these workplace guidelines also um, should be used. Thanks, Jameson. And you know, just to add on to that, uh, that was. And I don't know if you and I were the. If, if I had this discussion with you or not, Jameson, but I know it, it came up on more than one occasion at summit. And that is that, you know, I, I think what we were finding in some of our workshops was that a lot of folks, you know, very well-meaning individuals. I, I want to say that up front. We're, we're looking for, you know, quote unquote, plug and play sort of solutions. And 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 I think just to just to tack on to um, to Jameson's point, that's not what this is. It's not. I mean, sure, it's a guide, and uh, guide being the operative word, but um, it's not. You're going to have to mold this to your particular situation in in your company. And 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 one other point about that too is, I'm a big student, um, and Jameson knows this. He's heard me say it a hundred times. Is I'm a big student of culture in a company, and for those of you that are on the phone. Only you know what the culture of your company is like with respect to what buttons you can push, how, how, how far you can push 
the envelope with respect to your diversity initiatives and, and how to get these implemented. So you need to take that in, into consideration as you work with these and bring them back into your ERGs or back into your DNI departments or your HR department and work with them because, you know, the, the, this all doesn't happen in a vacuum. And I think the context for that conversation and for that work, that very good work, is the culture of, of your individual companies. So um, I think that's very important for, for folks to take away today. Okay? Did I hear somebody come on or no? Uh, hi, hi, Stephanie. It's um, it's Jenna with Christina. We finally got to where we were going. Oh, great, great. Well, uh, what what I basically have gone through is just kind of provided a backdrop. Jameson added some additional comments with respect to, you know, how these came about, the genesis of all of these, how we, you know, it, it came out of the out of the tack, and you know, it represents a lot of hard work by a lot of folks, and and it represents the collective experience and, and, and knowledge of uh, the individuals of the Trans Advisory Committee. And uh, I was just about ready to jump into the various sections kind of from a broad brush perspective, so it would probably be a good point to uh, hand off to you to kind of go through those sections. But we've covered all the upfront with respect to the overview and, and kind of how we came to where we are today. Thanks, Stephanie. And um, yeah, I, I just um, – I mean, just one final note on the background for the for the guidelines is that everything that that um, Stephanie and Jimison had, had indicated um, absolutely spot on, of course. But it, you know, a lot of it does you know come down to the fact that no two transitions are alike, and it's important that you have a set of guidelines that that you can do exactly what they were were referring to is, is mold them. Make them your own. Follow what you need to follow that is specific to your transition, not somebody else's, not how you would like it to be, but what you need to do in order to transition in the workplace. So with that said, um, we do have, um, as we have been referring to, we do have a set of guidelines. And there are various sections. There are about nine sections so far in the guidelines. And these are guidelines that are being currently molded. Um, I think as Stephanie had indicated that you know we had um, a lot of good input at the recent summit, and we're taking that input back. We're going to be uh, moving, you know, good ideas and and maybe even not some of the good ideas, if you will, into the guidelines, and um, they will be um, uh, drafted, further drafted. And you know we hope to have them you know done during the first quarter of of next year. So so they're currently a work in, in progress. And I think at the moment um, you know we have an introduction. Um, or actually I'm going to um, step back from that is that we'll actually have a synopsis for the guidelines because right now they're about 18 pages ish long, but we we will have a synopsis document that'll be you know around one one two pages. It'll be you know high level. Uh, somebody can you know can take it, get an idea as to the contents of the of of the guidelines. Um, somebody from HR or management or DNI can you know can circulate them around as appropriate. And then you know for the real nuts and bolts of what is in the guidelines and who will use the guidelines, then obviously one can then refer directly to the guidelines. So. Um, so with uh, the, the guidelines, we have you know, the overall objective of the guidelines, and that's pretty much as we've just indicated um, in our recent discussions. And then the next uh, major section of the guidelines is really company policy. And it's important that um, the transitioning individual, especially the transitioning individual, be aware of their company policies and what is available to them. You know, for instance, does their employer have um, a gender non-discrimination policy? Um, is there a DNI policy? What is in that policy? Uh, so it, it's important that you be aware of your uh, policies and, and what is in them. Um, is there non-discrimination? No, re 
no retaliation, um, what specific health benefits are included in in your policies? Is there a specific you know right to right to privacy highlighted in your policies? If you go all the way um, and have a medical transition, what are the leave and time off policies? Uh, are they you know generic, um, the same for everyone, or is there something specific for a transitioning individual? So one needs to be aware of you know the company policies, and that is a very excellent place to begin. Um, so the next major section is the consideration of the employee's expectations. And that is what you as a transitioning employee, you know, what are your specific expectations? Um, it's important that you define your expectations really before going down the path to transitioning. Um, and seeking perhaps other input within the company, going to HR or, or your manager. Because it's the last thing that they want to do is, is, is put words in, say, your mouth or direct your transition. Um, that's, not, that's not really what should happen. This is your transition, and you need to direct the best of um, your abilities and also you know, to how you, you feel comfortable. So it's important to you know highlight you know your your own expectations, and then also now in the case of um, HR professionals who are implementing um, guidelines in anticipation of someone transitioning, what we're presenting here is something that's very very broad. Um, we try to include enough categories so that. It would prompt you to look through your own policies, your own um, other guidelines, uh, your company mission statement, things of those nature, and then be able to modify the, the template that is provided here in these transition guidelines in order to make it applicable to your own company, but still broad enough to take into consideration uh, the needs from people who are transitioning to the P to uh, on the other side to people who are who are not transitioning but are um, are, are, uh, are gender diverse in their uh, um, presentations, for example. Um, so the guidelines are kind of broad on that in that respect. So it will work for both. Um, we're, we're talking this presentation. We're talking to both people who are considering a transition where an employer does not have guidelines and for companies that are um, putting these in place for in the, in the event that they do have someone who is uh, transitioning at some point. Okay. One of the sections that's in the guidelines is, uh, is the transition planning section. And we give a number of different um, criteria that the that the um, person transitioning uh, and the person, who, you know, the managers of that person, coworkers of that person, HR people, if there's a diversity group, um, may want to be aware of and to be considered as part of this planning, of the planning phase. So that when the when the process begins. It begins with some a, a, an individual giving notice that um, I'm gender diverse, I'm transsexual, I'm transgender, etc., uh, and I have this intention of some type of a transition, whether it's just to uh, a different presentation or work, or whether it's to actually perform a medical transition. But the, the, the guidelines recommend that a notification of transition be provided to a manager, to an HR person, uh, to somebody that the employee can feel comfortable in discussing this with. The guidelines recommend that companies provide a number of different individuals or groups, maybe an ERG, that um, could be a first point of contact and then guide the transitioning employee through the process. Um, the various different 
uh, there's a number of criteria here that are considerations for transitioning as to who you notify, how you do the notification. Um, these will have to be modified depending on your, your, your company. If you're talking about a small company where everybody knows everyone, that's one consideration as to how your plan is going to evolve. If you're talking about a very large enterprise where there's people distributed in a work group around the world, that's a different consideration. So as you're putting these together, as you're building your guidelines, um, keep in mind that, um, that you'll need to you know, incorporate you know, planning and communication as part of uh, as part of the process. Thank you, Christina. Um, I'm going to pick it up with the uh, with the um, a few other sections. There's another section, um, or another section dealing with issues associated with the transition process, and that's kind of an open-ended thing in a way because there could be a lot of issues and there could be very few issues. It really depends on the nature of um, in part the employee and also the company, but also the other people within the company, you know, one's colleagues. Because it's not just that one person would transition or move to a place where they feel comfortable in their gender identity and expression. It's just that everybody has to transition with you. And some people may do that actually better than others. So dealing with issues associated with the transition process can be a critical stage in actually making the transition successful. And if it's going to be the first within a company, that's definitely what you want to be. If you're going to be the center or the trend setter, let's set a good trend. So there's a section there um, dealing with associated issues with the transition process. I'm not going to go into the specifics. But those will be highlighted in the guidelines, and they'll, they'll take too long. Um, but that is one, one section. Another section is the appearance and customer and supplier con contact and restrooms. And within that section, we have the company expectation. Um, as a company does have the right to regulate, for instance, employee appearance and behavior in the workplace for reasonable business purposes. Um, that is not based on um, uh, gender or or sex or anything like that. It's just that they do have a reasonable right to um, you know, regulate the employee's purpose. It may be a matter of security. It may be a matter of safety. So, um, but nevertheless, a transgender employee is permitted to dress consistently with their gender identity, but also required to comply um, with the same standards of dress and appearance as it applies to all other employees in, in the workplace. There's a section for customer and supplier contact for employees and how that may be handled with the transitioning employee. Restroom access is addressed within the guidelines. And in short there, the transgender employee or transitioning employee will, will be allowed to use the restroom of, of their chosen and expressed gender identity. Um, that shouldn't really be much of an argument. There shouldn't be too much confusion there. Um, it should be just as is. Another section within the guidelines, the guidelines for management and human resources. Um, that is an important section um, as when the employee informs their HR person, they may or may not have any ideas to what really to do. And that's you as the transitioning employee, you know, really do become the leader in your own transition. But I would say most, if not all, you know, HR persons or a DNI person, uh, you know, would, would be very, very willing to assist and help and guide and, and learn. Um, that's really what they're there for. Another section, statement of confidentiality. The initial conversation you know, with HR and the manager is highlighted in the guidelines. Addressing the concerns of coworkers. And some key points there is to remind all employees that they're expect, expected to conduct themselves in accordance with company policies and the mission statement. 
Um, also, job planning okay, for a gender transition is, is, is highlighted. Pronoun and name changes are covered in the guidelines. And then one of the biggest ones is the health insurance. That's also covered in the guidelines. Before we spend any time on the health insurance, I did want to highlight within the guidelines themselves, okay, there's those sections there that I've indicated. And then there's a section for additional resources. And that's a list of internal resources that may be applicable to most companies, but also external resources, such as the National Center for Transgender Equality, of course, Out and Equal Workplace Advocates, um, you know, Human Rights Campaign, um, PFLAG, um, etc. So there's a list of external resources that one can turn to for for information. And there's and then within the guidelines there's various appendices. Okay, one is an outline um, for the actual transition itself. Another one is highlighting the, the insurance um, coverage and procedures that, that are covered when one goes through a medical transition from male to female and female to male. And obviously that's a big part of you know, health insurance and what, is, and what is covered. And I do want to be conscious of the time because I know Jameson is on the call and um, I know now would be a good time to pass it to you, Jameson. Perhaps go over health insurance in conjunction with a W pass. What I'm trying to deal with the chat thing, the questions that are coming in on the chat thing. Were you talking to me about the uh, the health care business and the standards and the uh, <laughs> and how we reflect on that in the in the guideline? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Let me catch up here. Um, and, and just to give Jameson a, a moment to catch up, I be, we were getting a lot of questions about when will the guidelines be released, and I believe it is the ex expectation to be in the first quarter of next year. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Yeah. And if we want, Christina could talk just a little bit about the guidelines and then give Jameson a chance to catch up. Mm -hmm. There are, um, Jenna alluded to the, the guidelines list in the appendices, um, a series of procedures that are uh, associated with a medical transition. Um, it's not an exhaustive list. We did try to make it as complete as possible. Um, you will find today considerable discussion relating to um, WPATH recommendations and insurance company coverages um, and this list as to what may be covered by, an by, by a particular payer. Some do not cover all of these procedures. Some cover part of them. Um, some cover all of them. Um, <clears throat> we actually took the list from our so this is actually a list that, uh, that I have helped present, uh, prepare um, two years ago and presented to our benefits people for, for our coverage. So there are some companies that do offer uh, coverage for all these procedures. Um, but it's still, it's, going, it's still for a lot of people, a lot of companies, um, and a lot of payers, it's a negotiating point. Um, there is... Uh, as Jameson will be able to point out, there is a lot of information in the standards of care, uh, version 6, with the, um, the letter on med medical necessity, and version 7 that actually mm -hmm. outlines a number of procedures um, and the criteria for, in, uh, for medical necessity of various different procedures. And with that, I think Jameson is the expert. <laughs> to discuss that. I'm ready now. I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. I'm I'm mentally back. Um so yeah, the standards of care are basically the guideline that 
has existed for 35 years that has been used in a number of, um, you know, shall we say, official, legal, um, medical contexts to essentially support the reality and the necessity for these kinds of treatments. And um, it's cited in State Department documents justifying the, the um, change to passport policies. It's cited in, by, a, by the American Medical Association. WPATH is recognized by them as the Association of Medical Experts uh, surrounding transgender care. And so we, in our, in our activism through the Corporate Equality Index, relied on the WPATH standards of care as a guideline to help employers understand what kind of level, what level of care need to be provided, needs to be provided to, through insurance plans as companies negotiate with their carriers. And that is the issue, that most carriers do not routinely offer this care. This is changing quite a bit. We now, with the 2015 uh, Corporate Equality Index that just came out a day or so ago, uh, we have 34% of the Fortune 500 corporations now offer trans-inclusive care. And 400 and I think it's 418 of the rated employers offer uh, transition-related care. So that's that's really a tremendous increase over the over the time that we've asked people since only 2009. If we asked people to provide uh, any, a, a plan that covers surgeries, prior to that the requirements were much lower. So now, uh, basically, the issue is that there's the coverage is uneven among different carriers, and employers need to be vigilant to make sure that they understand what services their carrier is actually providing and to insist that they do provide the services that are actually necessary. And that's why we try to do the education around these the different procedures and the, to this level of detail. So the slide that you see here basically gives an out, sort of outline overview of the standards of care. Um, the sections one through four really are very very informative, and very helpful in, in how, having people understand what the health needs of trans people are and what and how systemic these issues are around the world. WPATH is a global organization. Um, we do have to negotiate with providers from all over the world in terms of what the content of the standard of care actually is. And so there are some things in the standard that that aren't always 100% American feeling, but um, you know, so it, it's sort of like the United Nations in the sense that we have to to come to some sort of compromise often between other other cultural concerns. So uh, it's still a work in progress. Um, we're already starting. We we at WPATH have already started to work on. Um, a, an update with some small revisions, but they will not be massive changes. Um, so it might be a 7.1 or 7.5, depending on on what what the level of changes are. But um, so the version seven is probably going to be a foundational version that going forward that is not going to change dramatically for quite some time, and I think it's very reliable, and um, and I encourage you all to read it if you haven't. It's a free download from WPATH.org. Great. Thank you so much for that, and that's been a very comprehensive overview of the 
guidelines and the standards of care. And I think that um, people will be very intrigued to finally see the, the finished document. So for people that are interested in getting more information or to work on the guidelines, you can contact Andrea Shorter, and her information is on the screen in front of you. And the question was already answered about when will they be available and be toward the end of the first uh, quarter by the end of the first quarter of 2015. At this point, we are getting close to running out of time. We do have uh, one question, and it is, are there any materials that you could provide to an, an attendee on how and where to start this conversation with your HR department within an organization? I'll just open that up to anybody that wants to answer that one. It's Steph. I'll, I'll jump in. Um, I, I think there's a number of answers to that question depending upon the company that uh, that, that you work for. But um, one that comes to mind right off the bat is um, having the converse because it depends upon how, oh, for want of a better term, how, um, how safe one feels about moving forward um, and being public about it given what their culture is like. So, um, a safe haven potentially to have that conversation and, and, and begin to put put it out there it might be within one's employee resource group should one have one at their at their place of employment, their LGBT ERG. Um, I think that would be a good place to start. Um, there but you know, depending upon the the company that you work for, there might be different starting points. Uh, for me, in my own personal experience at my company, um, I went to the head of my department. And, and went out to lunch with her and had a conversation with her. That was only after I had individual conversations with people that I knew that I was close to, that I could that, that they could uh, that I could hold in, in my confidence. So, um, but that 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 again was dictated by the current climate uh, of my company at the time. So that's one thought that I have. Anybody I'll go else? Next. Yep. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, for myself, um, you know, I had I had come out directly to my HR rep and indicated that I was transgender and I wanted to transition at work. And you know, was there even any policies or guidelines at that time? And I think after checking, she came back and said no. And so that's um, how I started developing, you know, my set of guidelines. It actually turned out that somebody else was transitioning in the company nearly at the same time. We just didn't know it. And she had worked on or started her set of guidelines with someone else in the company. And then when we finally connected, um, you know, we combined all aspects of our transitions, and that's what led to the guidelines for Johnson & Johnson. So a good place to start, obviously, is, is HR. Um, it seems like, you know, if, you're, if there's ever a meeting or anything like that, I mean, who are they more afraid of in the room, you know, boss or HR? And she usually, usually ends up being HR. <laughs> um, so, it's, uh, you know, that's usually a good place to start if, um, if you're working in conjunction with HR already, um, then you're one giant step, um, or you've made one giant step, into, you know, in the right direction. Great. So we have just a few minutes left, and I want to give each of the panelists an opportunity to offer some closing comments. And um, so, Stephanie, can we start with you? Yes, John, by all means. Um, again, I, I would, would want to just reiterate what we talked about earlier, which is that this is a, a very iterative process, and we welcome the uh, comments and input um, of of all interested parties in, in, in crafting a, you know, a document that, that everybody's going to feel really good about and that they're going to actually use um, as when, when we do roll it out uh, in, in, in the beginning of next year. And then I also would be remiss if I did not uh, echo the comments that uh, Jameson made earlier about the Transgender Day of Remembrance. Um, we have a lot of allies on this phone call. 
and 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 I thank you for your for for being here, and I thank you for your support. Um, it, it's it's you know we can't our our journey to equality as trans and gender nonconforming people um, is one that we cannot walk alone uh, with, and and we need help and we need support, and we need people to carry the flag for us, and uh, so that maybe at some point in time in the future we won't have to have transgender day of remembrances anymore. So. Uh, I look to uh, to the allies that are on the call to um, to, um, to to make a difference and to to help us move the needle uh, because it's 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 by doing so that we uh, will make the world a better place. So thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Christina. Um, not to rehoe the ground that Stephanie just did. Um, just wanted to say that uh, in closing that we're very excited about putting these uh, guidelines in place. Um, we're trying to make them very, very broad so that they fit, um, so they can be proposed by either um, companies or people who are transitioning or by people who are transitioning in companies that don't have the guidelines. And we're trying to make them more guidelines rather than policies um, because a transgender umbrella is just so big and so encompassing that um, it has to be very, um, <clears throat> the guidelines also need to be equally encompassing and non-specific while still offering specific protections um, to the people who fall underneath the guidelines. So I'm really excited about being a part of that. And, uh, Great. Thank welcome. you, Chris. Thanks. Thank you, Christina. Jenna? No, thanks, John. I just wanted to say, um, you know, thank you for everybody taking the time to attend the call and, you know, for your interest in the, in the guidelines. You know, these, uh, I mean, just, again, not to reiterate pretty much what everybody else has said, but, you know, this is going to be, you know, a very important work. You know, more and more people are feeling comfortable, you know, in their own skin. And if one is going to to, you know, actually transition within the workplace and at home, you know, there is no best way to do it. Um, but there is you know, some better ways in which it can be done. Um, everybody is different, and we need to look at our own unique situations and, and move down that path that is going to be best positive for all of us. And having these guidelines will, will enable... You know, the transitioning employee, you know, do that. But also, you know, everyone around um, and help guide the company into, you know, making the right decisions that it should. Um, and that's an important point because, you know, we as employees, you know, we can help shape, you know, the company culture going forward. And it's not just what we do, but it's also how we can affect the culture of the company. And we start to affect the culture of the company, we start to affect the culture of society. And that's where we need to go, really, to make, um, uh, you know, perhaps a day like today, um, hopefully a happier, happier time. Thank you very much, Jenna. And last but not least, Jameson. Thank you, John. I really appreciate and echo the words of all my co-presenters today, and uh, I can only emphasize how grateful I am that all of you are listening and that all of you are willing to learn and to be change agents in your organizations. So thank you all so very much. Thank you, Jameson. And in closing, I just want to thank everybody for being a part of this call. I hope that people have taken away some great information. On behalf of Out and Equal Workplace Advocates, I thank the participants, and I truly want to thank the panelists for sharing your journey with us on this Transgender Day of Remembrance and bringing us all just a little bit more of hope. So thank you very much, and I hope that everybody has a wonderful day.